Okay, in this video, we're going to start note seven um, from Calc A to B, and it's about related rates. And related rates, a uh, big interesting topic. Uh, basically, what it sounds like, it's like a bunch of rates that are somehow related to each other. You know, like one gear is turning and it turns another gear, uh, which in turn will turn another gear. So the rate at which the final gear turns is related to the rate at which the first one turns, the rate at which the second one, like related rates. Um, Full disclosure, I'm gonna do the first six pages of these notes. The notes say that they're out of 16 pages. Uh, if uh, somehow I create more time in my life, I will go back and do the rest of them. The rest of them are just um, old AP questions. There's a list of those questions uh, on my website, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and you can find those on the internet and do them. I'll do them if I have time, but I'm gonna prioritize these six pages. So there's a really, really, I think it's the longest paragraph in any of my notes is uh, gonna kick off these. And so it's like an, a general idea of what related rates are. So, uh, and the concept we're gonna use is the idea of filling a tub, like a bathtub. So if there's nothing wrong with it, it's gonna hold water um, and not leak, right? That's the idea behind a bathtub. You put in a stopper, it holds water and you get, what if it's leaking? So uh, if, you, if you're leaking, then there's a different situation. So you're gonna walk in you're gonna start filling the tub. You're gonna fill it at one liter per minute according to uh, this problem. So you fill the tub one liter per minute. That's just, if nothing's leaking, then that's the rate of change of the volume of water that's uh, in the tub and, and you're done. But if another person walks in and starts helping you, so they're gonna start and they can do uh, 0.5 liters per minute. So now overall, the rate at which the volume is changing is related to your rate and your friend's rate, and the total rate of change is 1.5 liters per minute. So you've already got kind of a related situation. What if there's a hole or the drain stop doesn't work, which actually used to be the case in my bathtub, which I didn't discover until we were having a hurricane and I was like thinking I should fill my tub so that I'd have water, you can use it to like flush the toilet, whatever. Um, I tried to fill the tub and I like put the stopper in, I ran the water and the tub like filled up. Uh, and then I like, I was like, good, I got all the water I needed. And I left, and I come back, there's like, uh, like one eighth of the water is left because it turns out that I had a very slow leak in, uh, in the drain, not in the tub, just in like the mechanism that stops water from leaking, whatever. Uh, so you could have a hole and it's possible that when there's a hole in the tub, even though you're filling it one liter per minute, your friend's doing 0.5 liters per minute, the tub is leaking. It's leaking at a rate of 0.25 liters per minute. So you and your friend are putting water in at 1.5, but it's leaking at 0.25. What's your overall rate of change there? Your overall rate of change is just 1.25. You're still increasing because you, the amount you're putting in is greater than the amount leaking out, but not by as much as you really think. So these rates are related, right? The overall rate of change is related to all three of them, you, your friend, and the tub leaking. So that's kind of the idea. There's a few very common mistakes that I see people make, and then we're gonna actually do a problem, like which seems like forever. Um, so potential pitfalls, I just wanna highlight these because I think that going into it knowing them is better. So the first thing, making the rate of change have the wrong sign. So sometimes a rate is positive, like if I'm putting water into the tub, my rate, the, the rate of change of the volume is positive because I'm putting water in. If the water's leaking out, the rate of change is negative because water is leaving. So in general, if something gets bigger over time, its rate is usually positive. If something gets smaller over time, its rate is usually negative. And that's how I usually think about these things. The other thing is setting up the problem. There's a lot of geometry involved here. Um, and I see it all the time. People just draw the wrong picture or in their picture, they decide they're gonna try to solve for the wrong thing. So you gotta really know what you're looking for. And then forgetting that the derivative of a constant is zero is murder on these problems. Also, I guess I should say like plugging in uh, values too soon is a big issue that we haven't really run into yet. So anything that can change over time, you have to make a variable. Anything that doesn't change over time, you don't necessarily need to make a, a variable. So we'll do examples um, and you'll see like, uh, maybe I'll do both so you can like get a sense of it. But let's, uh, let's actually do a problem and see what's happening. So. If X and Y are both changing with respect to T, so this is interesting. So with respect to T means that T is the independent variable. 
So x is a function of t. y is a function of t. So both of them change with respect to time. So for example, you might have uh, two people that are running away from each other. And so the, the distance of the first person from the starting point is a function of time. The distance of the second person from the starting point is also a function of time. And they'll have different rates of change. So in this case, we know that dx dt is 5 and dy, no, we want to find dy dt. So we're looking for dy dt when x is 3, given x times y cubed equals 24. All right, so it, said, there's like, it says there's a hidden, uh, a secret little algebra problem hidden in here. Um, let's, let's figure that out. I don't know what that problem would be just yet. Um, so x and y both change with respect to time, which means I do not want to substitute anything for them. I just want to find the derivative with respect to time overall. So I'm going to say that I'm looking for d dt of x times y cubed, and that should be equal to d dt of 24. Okay, so x is a function of t, which means the derivative of x with respect to time is dx dt. y is a function of t, which means the derivative of y with respect to t is dy dt. So it's like you have to use a chain rule everywhere when you do these problems. So it's going to be first derivative of the second. So the derivative of something cubed is three times that thing squared times the derivative of that thing. But y is a function of t, not of x. So the derivative of y with respect to t is dy dt. That's the first part of the product rule. Now the second part, right? First derivative of the second plus second, which is y cubed, times derivative of the first with respect to t. The derivative of x with respect to t is dx dt. So dx dt. And then the derivative of 24 is just going to be 0. OK. So let me like highlight the different things that are in here, right? So we have x. So it's first derivative of the second plus second derivative of the first. So the derivative of x is dx dt in this context. Then we had um, the derivative of the second, um, which included a dy dt because of the chain rule. And then second. So that's just where everything came from, in case you're like into that. So now what do we do? I need to know what x is. Well, I know what x is, right? So uh, let's highlight some givens. So x is definitely 3. Uh, dx dt is definitely 5. We're looking for dy dt. I also don't really know what y is yet. This is the little algebra problem. So since I know this relationship is true, and I know that x is 3, I know that 3y cubed equals 24. So y cubed is 8. So y is equal to 2. OK, so I'm actually going to end up substituting all of these values, right? So everything in kind of like orange is going to be substituted at this point. So I will get 3 times 3, 2 squared. dy dt is what we're solving for, plus uh, 2 cubed. dx dt was given as 5 equals 0. So we have this, and then uh, so dy dt is equal to what? Uh, negative 40. So it's, it's 8 times 5, and then subtract it. So negative 40 divided by uh, 4 times 3 times 3, 4 times, so 36. So I'm going to say, and you could leave that potentially. Uh, dy dt is uh, negative 10 over 9. There are no units in this problem. Units are super important when you do these, but in this case, uh, there's just no units at all. So I would say that this is my final answer, and I'm just looking for a good color to highlight in. Any color, use this. This is my final answer. I think dy dt is this. So that's the process. The real difference is that you're not taking the derivative with respect to x. So the derivative of x is no longer 1. The derivative of x now is dx dt. The derivative of y is no longer dy dx because the independent variable is t. So the derivative of y is now dy dt. So we're still product ruling. We're still chain ruling. But now we have to really keep in mind, like, what is the variable? What's the independent variable? And in this case, it's t. So these are the things that we run into. It's just implicit differentiation. It's just a different independent variable. Chain rule, product rule, quotient rule, anything could happen. Um, sometimes there is this additional little problem, like we had to do 
3y cubed equals 24 and solve for y. Not really a big deal. Um, and then sometimes they seem strange to begin with. Like a lot of people are really uncomfortable with a lot of these problems when we first do them. But if you give them a chance and you practice them and then read them again, right? Like when you're done, don't just move on. Like sit back, think about it. See if you can do it again, maybe on a blank piece of paper or whatever. Um, you're going to be fine. This is just implicit differentiation, just with a lot of context. So I'm going to stop this here. Come back in the next video. Do some more. See you then.